Good morning, everybody, and welcome to ILC Home Webinar number nine. Uh, we started this with helping each other through the challenge. Um, so I want to thank, first of all, thank everybody for the support. We've had some fantastic audience numbers, some great reaction, terrific feedback, and so many people telling us that, you know, we, we are trying to deal with the subjects that are real and can affect the, the day-to-day situation we're in and, and like today sometimes we're going to try and rise above that and take a bigger picture which is very difficult at the moment clearly so all your ideas are welcome um, you can always contact me at alan at iloveclaims.com um, whether you've been introduced through our newsletter or emails uh, whatever media you want again if you want added to them either go onto our website or, or email um, newsletters are also following up some of the situations that we look at, for example, I think Kate McKenzie of Courtesy Kitchens and Bathroom, we did a follow-up with her following our wellbeing session, which I think was number three in the ILC webinars, and we're going to be following up, up with more people <laughs> in the wellbeing session, uh, so we'll do more of that in ILC news next week. Um, next week's webinar, we're going to go back to looking at the base of building claims and how they're progressing with the contractors. Uh, the loss adjusters, the insurers, and we've got some legal views on that as well coming on. So that'll be quite interesting as we're all getting nearer getting back to work. But today we're, we're going to look at two aspects. Uh, first, we're going to revisit what I think was our second ILC webinar a little bit uh, with uh, Martin and Kelly. Uh, Martin and Tim and that week talked about alternative accommodation, the challenges that had, had to be met and moving people out of hotels into other accommodations and following up from the flood. So we're going to take a catch up on where we are with that as things start to move back the way, or, or if they are. And then we're going to take a look, following some comments in last week's webinar, um, where uh, I think uh, there was a comment about cash settlement increasing. We're going to take a, a bit of a higher look at that. And in this environment, what are the dynamics that are affecting everybody from looking between cash settlement and fulfilment and what might the repercussions be as we, we look forward and how we can deal with it. So we will be looking at that. The like great panel today, Brian Moore, uh, Head of Claims Procurement at Aviva. Brian's an old friend of ILC um, and he's one of the of us. We will try not to lapse too much into glass weeding tonight. Today. Mm -hmm. um, Martin Oldjoy, the MD of the Alternative Accommodation Agency. Kerry Lee, who's a director um, at ICAB. And Sandy Fraser from Fraser's LLP. Sandy, of course, is a, for most of you who know him, has a wide background ranging from loss adjuster through to contractor, through to managing contractors and networks. So that'll be a good wide view from our uh, panellists today. Any questions, there's a question section at the bottom, which you can do that. You can enter a chat. You can also email me any questions because I do look at it occasionally, uh, alan at iloveclaims.com. Um, so first of all, as I said to everybody every time, there's no right or wrong answers to what anybody says today. We're in a very, very unusual position. So we just really hope that everything that everybody contributes helps people think it through and, and hopefully moves them all forward. So first of all, I'm going to go to Martin. Martin, in a back seven a webinars ago, we were taking, we just put loads of people out of hotels into other alternative accommodation not a lot work was taking place. Uh, what's changed? Are we beginning to see a, a well, hotels aren't open, but are we beginning to see a move back from people out of alternation into, into properties? Or is there an indication about when that might happen? Um, um, just quick answer. But, um, I think it does seem like so long ago that we Martin, I think we're just Martin. So I think we're just a bit of a. You can hear the microphone. It just seems to be a bit of interference there. Yeah, sorry, it turned up. We get a full view of mine. Now, in that case, but there you are. Um, is that better? Yeah, I can hear better now. Thank you. Um, yes, so we were entering, uh, same as everybody, uh, the unknown uh, situation. Fortunately, the, the, the good thing that came out of that really for us was um, the availability of short bed accommodation, service departments, holiday accommodation, as we spoke about at the time, the 
The vast majority of policy holders really have just they got so good at it. Extended, I would say, ninety percent of our policy holders in accommodation right through to the end of June, uh, possibly into July. But uh, the last uh, week, week and a half, two weeks, we've, we've just seen the, the green shoots, if you like, of, uh, of recovery of, of a, a loosening of the rules and. Um, uh, a number of policy holders in our contact now saying enough is enough, we're, we're quite fed up, we'd like to move back to that property, you know, it's almost ready or will be ready or it's just minor things that we do can't be playing. Um, so we're seeing uh, um, a wave of uh, keenness to uh, get back home uh, and move on. And I think that as we go forward the next few weeks, uh, that's going to increase, there's going to be a lot more pressure um, from, from the public to get moved back home from policy holders. And um, that side of things are really going to, going to kick off. Martin, I think there's still a, a couple of problems in interference in the background there. I don't know whether somebody suggested a headset, but I don't know whether you've got one of them. I have got one actually, but I haven't tried it. Martin, no. that sounds great. Is it? Okay. <laughs> what you've okay. done just worked. Oh, well, good. In okay. that case, I can sit back and relieve you from, <laughs> so then, from the look. Uh, back over, Kelly, uh, how have you found it? What, what's changed in the seven weeks since uh, Tim was on? Have you seen the beginning of uh, movement again? Yeah, I mean, since the, the last announcement, whenever I lost all sense of time, but whenever that was, that... The first, there were two, there's been two really, I suppose, major things. Firstly, that contractors can now go into people's homes um, obviously with all the correct PPE, but the fact that contractors can now go into people's homes means that works can start again. So we are seeing, we have, and certainly in the last week, we've seen a real uplift in, in business. And also, not certainly not all, but lots of letting agents now are starting to do uh, live viewings rather than online viewings of properties. So again, people can start to move into rentals. Um, I think it's just given people a sense of ease, really that they feel a bit more kind of motivated to get going and a bit more confident in, in the system. So we've definitely seen an uplift in the last week to 10 days. And then also now all our furniture suppliers, the removal suppliers, our ICAB pods, we've got all the correct, everyone's got the correct PPE. Everyone's ready to go. I think it's taken a while, but everyone's ready to go. So, you know, we, we, we weren't able to do internal pods, but we carried on doing externals. Well, now we can do both. So, yeah, there's definitely been an uplift. There's def the general public, I think, have been very understanding, actually. And now their reluctance to move out or to start moving into accommodation seems to be calming down a bit. And I think we've certainly seen this in the last week, 10 days, um, an uplift and, and starting to move into, into options again. Okay, thanks. Brian, from a, a, a higher angle, are, you, are are we beginning to be prepared to move people from floods back into accommodation? Is the work beginning to get through, or do you think there's still going to be a period of uh, slower progress? Well, I, I think for us, it's, it, it's just a continual day-by-day -day, um, match of supply and demand for us. Um, I mean, I, I think from an AA perspective, uh, I, I don't see the, the claim by claim detail, but it's something that we were certainly worried about at the start and things moved far quicker than we expected at the start. But it's not something we've, we've worried too much about since then. I think just between cu customers being uh, reasonable, um, the, the supplier's doing a cracking job in moving to meet that demand. It's made our job probably easier than we had thought as times moved on. But um, 
I, I think it's just going to be a, a, a gradual move, but it, but it's not something rightly or wrongly that we're, we're hugely worried about right now. Sandy, from your perspective, any your clients seen a, a, a shift towards people moving out of alternative accommodation or is the shift back to people repairing homes not as big as some people might think it is at the moment? I think uh, we're just beginning to see it, Alan. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of at phase one moving into phase two and I think that people are becoming a little more comfortable now. Uh, you know, I think really the, everything that's going on just now in supply chain is revolving around the customer and we're beginning to see signs that the customer is more, more comfortable uh, with the situation. So it started, but it's gradual. Thank you. Martin, then from a strategic or a, or a product offering method, we, we saw this, what seemed to be great flexibility. Hotels shut down and we were able to find other lets for them. These other lets, of course, were available for the same reason as the, in many cases, as the hotels shut down. Has this shown the industry, the hotel of accommodation, has a lot of flexibility? Or has it just shown that... The, Whatever happens, the, the needs that would ever shut down a hotel would open up other lets as well. And, and what have you learned from that? Yeah, I definitely think that um, horrible the situation has been. It has um, opened the eyes to a lot of people in the industry. Um, you know, going back enough years, alternative accommodation was either a hotel or a six month or longer traditional rental property. But there's so many options that are available in between. Um, Kelly mentioned the, uh, the the pods, you know, the, the, the temporary kitchens and bathrooms, the curtsy kitchens and bathrooms are fantastic solution for people who don't want to move into accommodation, that do want to stay at home. Um, and we've utilised those uh, for a number of um, for a number of years. In terms of hotels, I think we are moving towards them reopening. That would be um, one of the, the larger chains talking about uh, towards the end of June, 1st of July. There'll definitely be um, a move back to hotels. Uh, it's, I suppose, the, the easiest fix if you get a, an out of hours uh, instruction late at night and people want hotel accommodation, then you know the, ma the major brands are generally the first option. But in terms of um, after that initial period, I think there are some great options in terms of short lets, service departments, holiday lets. I mean, some of the holiday companies that we use that provide the, the, the holiday lodges and, and the chalets, they appear to be reopening again uh, mid-June. Um, so those options are available. But I think probably there will be just a general return to okay, we need accommodation, we'll have two weeks in a hotel and then we'll look for a six-month let, even though probably only six or eight weeks accommodation is required. So it is really just a case of looking at all the options and deciding which one fits best. Um, in terms of policyholders now having contractors in their properties, I'd imagine that whereas the preference was to stay at home, the preference is now going to be we need to be out even though we're only having a small amount of work a kitchen or a bathroom we don't want to be in the property with the contractors at this particular time so let's have alternative accommodation for however period is required and not have that dual you know staying in the property and having contractors in there so i think we'll see a lot more of those smaller cases coming through where people traditionally maybe would have stayed at home now will want aa Mute. You're muted, Alan. We've lost you, Alan. Lost you. Um, are the choices widening? And what's the effect of widening? Have, you, have, you, have we found that what people might have thought originally was the better option um, from both a cost and service perspective might have changed through the fact that you've had to forcibly remove people from one place to another? So is that yeah. pointed at me yet? No, that was not pointed at Kelly. Sorry, Brian. Well, 
The thing is, whilst the hotels are opening, they're probably they're still going to be room only. So, I think I think the flexibility of the suppliers has been amazing, and without wishing to be rude, it's because it's their only option to have business. You know, so they are offering, for example, whereas a service department, off the top of my head, might usually in normal times say that they would only do a minimum fourteen days. They're happy to take three nights, four nights. Um, so I think the flexibility of the suppliers, our suppliers, is going to be very important. And we've already, and also, you know, one of our guys, who's one of our uh, senior claims handlers, he's got the real relationships with a lot of our hotel account managers. And they've already said to us, you know, we'll be very flexible on prices. They're already negotiating prices because they want the business. So I think, um, I think that's, that sounds crude, like I said, but it's a positive that will, that will come out in terms of the costs that will be, Fast on will be less to the insurers um, and, and landlords will be the same. So I think it will just be the continued flexibility really of landlords and hotels and service departments and as Martin said, the holiday lets and all of that. Thank you. Brian, this does kind of move us over to, to the next section of it as well, about customer choice and some of the options. So even before we slightly go on to the car settlement fulfilment thing, the, the might become a pressure on, on insurers and adjusters uh, to look at alternative accommodation because uh, more people perhaps fall into the category of not wanting to work with people in their homes, they're more vulnerable in different ways. Um, that obviously wouldn't be a good cost option, uh, I accept, but is that one of the other dynamics that's going to come in here? Somebody who would normally be able to live in a home when it was being repaired might be vulnerable in a different way from the way we've looked at it before and might be looking to move out while the work's done. Is that to me, Alan? Yeah, sorry, Brian, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 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 don't, I couldn't comment on individual uh, customers, but it's not something that I'm seeing. I'm, I, I've, I think our experience would be the opposite, where customers are doing everything they possibly can to, 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 to stay in the house. The, the, the other guys might have, have other details. In fact, I've seen, as Kelly said, you had some amazing examples of customers and their suppliers going way out. Uh, I mean, it's, it is a detail, but we had a, one story of a vulnerable customer um, where the builder just couldn't, it was near, it was just around about lockdown and the customer was disorientated. You know, they wanted to stay in the house. The, the builder went back to their office and ripped out what was a, a kind of work shelf and went back and installed it as a, as a worktop in the customer's house to keep the, the kitchen going and kept the customer in the house so things that were just outrageously way out of what would be it would normally be reasonable to keep customers in their house because that uh, that's what they wanted um so I, I don't think you'll see a shift from people wanting to move out their house it's probably the, the i'm sure you'll have examples um where, where customers quite rightly are worried about having people in their house but but it is their house um so they're generally, uh, they, they generally want to stay there. Okay. Sandy, any views from you? Are you seeing that from contractors that you work with that uh, are readily going in? Certainly has great stories about people uh, going the extra mile to help mm. policyholders, as we have from insurers like Aviva and others that have been on have gone the extra mile to, to look after the suppliers and, and help them service it. Is that going to become... A more difficult task as the demand and supply equation evens up a little bit. Well, I think suppliers in general uh, are, are very inventive, Alan. Um, they're very focused on the market that we, we work in, and they want to deliver solutions. So, you know, we live in very unusual times, but I can think of some great examples of, of contractors who have use a common phrase, gone the extra mile, but really, as Brian has illustrated there, you know, they, they think in their feet, they're looking for options, um, and they're delivering, and I've heard some great stories. Okay. Yeah, good comment. Back to you, Brian, so I'll get you ready for this one. Moving on to uh, what we talked about earlier. Last, last week it was raised, and I think the week before, you know, I, I, they were asking if insurers were looking for cash settlements, that what was put right a little bit last week. But of course, uh, there are a number of cash settlements taking place just now, and, and I guess there are quite a few dynamics behind that type of claim coming in, people's nervousness, etc. From from a high level, how how are you seeing that 
materialising at the moment? And, and perhaps what do you think you might have to do to be ready for it in the future? So I think uh, we, we're in a fortunate position in Aviva that we, uh, we are very, uh, I'm sure all would say this, we are very customer orientated uh, and generally um, we, we, our guys in the doctorate, they, they indoctrinated into understanding what, what does the customer want. Yeah. So there's always choice. Um, the balance for me is I, I, I need to make sure that we've got a sustainable network, a, a, a strong, profitable, sustainable network. And that in cash settlement doesn't always sit brilliantly side by side. So, but, but, but I think we straddle it reasonably well. What we're doing at the moment, I think, is we're at a stage where you've, you've got customers, the needs of a customer 15 weeks ago, eight weeks ago, and today are different. Um, and we've seen some customers who quite understandably want our fulfillment solution and, and want the comfort of our fulfillment solution a number of weeks later, the house is kind of dried out and everything looks not just as bad and they want a cash settlement. In all those cases, we will go with what the customer wants. And to, to a larger extent, cost doesn't really come into it. We'll pay the right amount for, for either fulfillment or cash. Um, so I, I think that, that number one, what does the customer want today? What do they want next week? What do they want the following week? We'll keep in touch with that and make sure we stick with that. The only other dynamic I would add to that is that as time goes on, when customers don't want people in their house, then they do want people in their house, there is a risk that if we're not careful, we end up with a work in progress uh, that we can't service, right? So we continually listen to uh, what, what, what the customers want and we end up, when they do want people back in their house, we, we struggle with the capacity needed to do it all at once. So I think there's... There's the customer dynamic, but there's also the, the, the week, and, and we do follow our work in progress day by day, availability of, of, um, of materials, etc. cetera. Um, and that's pretty fundamental because you could be trying to do the right thing by the customer, and then when the proverbial floodgates open, albeit more slowly than they might, we're in a position where we can't deliver what they want. So we, we will use cash settlement where need be. We've got thousands of claims sitting in progress and a huge amount of them aren't doing anything right now mm. if that keeps building and building that's not a good thing for us or the network or the customer so we we will we will balance that and and we need we will try and balance the customer need with the the, the, the work in progress we have how have you found that in terms of balancing that back out to the supply chain because it, it, this is a variable at the moment they're getting ready we hear rumors that people think there's a glut it's not necessarily a glut, but there's certainly a hold up. Um, so I guess getting information and good close contact with the availability uh, and the capacity of your network becomes really vital in these stages as you get through the coming months. I think so. I mean, we, we've got our own network. Uh, our, the guys that manage the network have been doing it for, for a lot of years. Um, and uh, I'm sure it'll be shot down here, but I, I think we've got a really good relationship with our network. Um, and it's not all about us, it's about them. They, they are working, some of the relationships we've had with the network, I, I looked after the network 10, 12 years ago, and there's a huge amount of the same names there today uh, as I was back then. They're working brilliantly together. They are, they've got WhatsApp groups where they're, when they come across materials that they've struggled with in a certain area, they're, 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 they're sharing that information. So there's a real, I think there's a, the, they're probably working closer than they did because we, whatever way we cut it, over the years we have worked in a siloed, the networks have worked in a, a siloed way. I think that's less so now. And if you look at it, one, one of the guys mentioned earlier on, it's about making sure this is the way I trade, therefore I need to do it. But some of it is about you know helping each other and making sure that we, 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 just, get, we, we just get through it. Sandy, from a contractor perspective, I mean, Bank points out to Aviva and the network and a few other insurers been on have been really, you know, working well with them over, over the last few months in particular. Longer is by says quite rightly. But if you're managing contractor and you've been a contractor there before, how do you quite sh not quite ensure what's about to come out and, and what could be a very slow release or, or, a, or a quick release? And we, we had a we, we had a vote on the ILC uh, LinkedIn group this week about how quickly uh, 
number might return to normal uh, in building claims. So from a contractor perspective, ready and prepared for this? I think uh, it, it might to a degree depend on the nature of the work the contractors are doing. I mean, I was talking to a contractor in London yesterday uh, who does mainly project management insurance uh, work and they are nearing back to capacity. Um, it's a lot easier for them perhaps to work in vacant properties um, than it is for contractors who are doing the, the more volume work, slightly lower value, um, because there are different challenges there when you know, the houses are occupied. Um, we're at a stage now where a number of contractors furloughed staff and they are planning ahead bring people back in, but they will need a book of work. So the claim volumes are down, but contractors, as I said, they're very adept, they're planning forward, they've got challenges just now in terms of uh, material supply, I think. Um, but I think over the next three, four months, perhaps in the medium term, the challenges with contractors are going to be more, more about cost rather than logistics. Yeah, I'm certainly that's an issue we'll be looking at next week when we look at more depth at, at the contractor position. Martin, what, what are you finding in talking to policy holders that you've been looking after for a while as, as things start to, as they look to move back? Are we finding that they're in more of a rush or they have been well communicated to? Um, and, and I guess, you know, within reason and without once they put in awkward possession, how well are you being communicated to by your clients to allow you to manage the policyholder through the situation? Um, well, to answer the, the, the second point first, I think communication could have been better, if I'm honest with you. We have struggled quite a bit to get to um, to get answers for um policyholders that are in accommodations, whether they could go back, whether their property is ready to go back to, whether we could look at moving them or extending them. Um, I suppose that's just a, 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 as a result of the, of the position that everybody's been in. All of our clients have all been working remotely and you know haven't, haven't been able to answer questions as quickly as they normally would have. So that's been difficult, but manageable. Um, on the other hand, as Kelly said earlier, the, the the general, the public at large have actually been quite quite good. They've been they've been uh, they're aware of obviously the situation that everybody's in, and when we've had to say to people, "Sorry, you're not moving back next week or two weeks' time; it'll be at least another month," they've kind of accepted the position and uh, almost, I think, a bit of a sigh of relief that they don't have to go through that move at a time when everything was still up in the air. You've got removal people coming and all sorts of other people in and out of the property that they're moving out of and moving home to. Probably quite square, quite scary for a lot of people. Um, so there has been this this patience, this general, okay, we're resigned to where we are, but now that's changing, now that's lifting. Um, and we, we've seen an increase in, in case numbers for people on the other side of the coin who have literally stayed at home waiting for their insurers or loss adjusters or claims companies to say, okay, contractors are going to start work on 1st of June or whatever. Let's start looking at alternative accommodation. Um, I, I'm sure Kelly will agree with me. The more time that we get to find accommodation, the easier it is for everybody and the better solutions for the policyholders. So uh, if nothing happens for two weeks and then there is this almighty surge of cases that come through it's going to be a scramble for accommodation and it's going to be you've got to move out in two days time this is really all all that we can offer you mm -hmm. um so the greater lead time we get obviously the better for all the policyholders and everybody concerned hey, are you beginning to see because like i agree unquestionably policy we had lots and lots of stories of the patience of policyholders but patience always eventually breaks and, and <laughs> That we're moving back to a more normal or a perceived movement back to a more normal generally in life. Are you beginning to find that some of your customers are going to chase things up and want to move on now? Do you know what? I think, listen, the priority is still got to be the physical and mental well-being of everybody, whether it's the policyholder, the staff or whatever. But people are looking, they've waited a long time, so they want to get going now. 
Um, but what I've also, what we've also found, which has benefited those people that want to get going now, is as we've started to bring back some of our furloughed staff, they've got this real kind of, not that they don't always give 100% because of course they do, but they've got this real drive and passion. I mean, in the last three days, we found that the staff we brought back this week are just knocking it out of the ballpark. Every claim that comes in, it's being done. Whether that's the general public who are just maybe in normal times might be a bit more pernickety or whatever. They're just willing to take what they can get to get the work done now um, as their confidence is growing or whether it's, you know, again, supplies or whatever. We are finding that everything's working really well. In the last week or so, everything's just been working well. And I think it's a combination of all of those things, of the staff, of the public, of the suppliers. Brian, uh, as these things change, Brian, we also have, the, somebody's asked it a little bit dramatically and anonymously. <laughs> um, as, as we move forward, there's going to be challenges in cost, aren't there? So wh- how do you manage to keep track of what uh, you would try to do overall as, as reasonable cash settlement, treating customers fairly, which was very important at Viva, when there may be varying costs to contractors because of the different working practices, et cetera, uh, with COVID-19. Somebody's mentioned PPI, but I'm going to leave away from that one. But it, but it, but it is a difficult task, even when a customer might be saying, look, I'd, I'd actually rather deal with this myself because I don't want people in my home. But, but we know there are cost challenges on working practices and materials. How easy is it for an insurer to sort of keep tabs on that? I don't think it's that difficult if you're close to the network, right? So, uh, as I say, if you start from what a customer, what's needed to get the customer back to normal, what the customer wants, there's a cost to that. Now, the one thing, you mentioned PPE, the the one thing I I look across claims, so whether within our motor world, we've had a a dramatic increase, that's now coming back up again and we're trying to work out uh, what, what what a new normal looks like. Well, we're doing exactly the same in property. What does a new demand look like? Will it be the exact? Are we assuming that things will just go back to normal? Will we just say that volumes down X percent today and it'll grow, it'll grow five percent every week until it's back to hundreds? Or will you have an, an, a huge amount of work, uh, people staying at home? Does that change the dynamic of the perils? Does is that a greater risk because there's more people at home? Is it a lesser risk because they turn the water off when there's a leak? Lots of hypotheses going around, but I think the demand will change. I don't know whether it'll be up down. I don't know whether new working practices because people because of social distancing will change. But I think the one thing is clear: our guys are all over it. They're working with the network. They're listening. They're talking to uh, our various networks. Um, you're talking to the big uh, building services, and we've kind of got an idea of where it will land. But it's changing by the week. Um, so whether it's cash or whether it's fulfilment is kind of irrelevant. We, we, we said, what we certainly won't do is say, if we fulfill it, it costs us more because you've got to be safe. If we cash it, we won't be safe, right? That, that's, that's worth more than our, you know, our brand's worth a wee bit more than that. So we will do absolutely the right thing, cash or not. Whatever the customer wants, it'll be right and it'll be the right price paid for the right job. The, the thing we don't know today is, what does a new frequency and what does a new severity look like in a, in a mid and post COVID world? The, the challenge then really for an insurer to some extent in, 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 in the unknown future, which changes <laughs> rapidly is, I, I guess, how do you keep your options and your supply chain fleet of foot enough to take care of what might be, you know, quite sudden variations or, or, or sudden variations or even regular ones. So how, how, What's, how easy is the challenge of keeping them ready, available and ready to ramp up or even ramp down? If that's a, if that's a... I, th- I think it's a really tactical bit of work, Alan, because it's literally, and it is a day-by-day matching of supply and demand. It's as simple as that. The customer tells us what we want and we've got to take that demand on a daily basis and make sure that we've got the right supply. Um, our network have been brilliant. They've been, and I think that it's probably fairly representative of, of networks. But our network have been fantastic. They've, they've, we've tried to work in a way that people can uh, furlough in an area where we don't have the volume, or we can consolidate it into certain areas where where, where it works. I, I'm sure there's areas where we've got it wrong, but predominantly, 
I, I'm not looking through many complaints right now that are saying we got it wrong, and but I'm looking at, at a lot of compliments where people are saying, "Oh my God, you, you guys have really done something that I didn't expect in, in a really difficult time." So to answer that question, I think it's day by day, week by week. What what we're not looking at doing right now is ripping up our network and starting again. We're, we're looking at saying uh, we've we've lost a bit of volume. We've had to do things differently. Things are getting back to a normal, whatever that normal becomes. And as long as we stay as close to the network and as long as they work as, as closely as they have and be as supportive and, and as open and honest as they have been, I don't think we'll have any issues. He says touch and wood. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Sandy, you've been in a position of running networks before, etc. Um, and what Brian's saying there, in recent weeks we've heard some great stories about insurers and the lengths they're going to and over the years getting closer to their network and, and, and even more so over the last few weeks. How promising do you think this is for the future um, and how, how much do you think that will have an impact on the service that the networks themselves and the contractors are able to provide? First of all, I think it's very promising. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to uh, hear Brian's take on it and I have to say um, from the people I'm interacting with just now, across the marketplace, particularly with uh, the direct insurers who have their own networks. Um, you know, almost uh, unanimous feedback from supply chain who are uh, absolutely delighted with the support that they have been given um, by their clients. So, you know, whether it be Aviva, LG, LV, you know, the, the support has been fantastic and hugely appreciated by, by contractors. Now, most of the contractors in our marketplace are, broadly speaking, you know, SME. Uh, a lot of them are owner-managed, the um, vast majority of them, and uh, they're desperate to go back to work. They're also very uh, ingrained in our marketplace. Now, some of them have other sectors that they operate in, but predominantly, you know, they're experienced in the insurance sector, and they know what that takes. It takes a different nature of a, of a contractor to work successfully in that, that arena. Um, so I, I think there will always be a place, and I've sat in a position similar to, to Brian's, uh, with a major insurer managing supply chain. You've always got to have an eye on indemnity spend um, and supply chain and whether it be cash or fulfillment. But I think there will always be a need for fulfillment. There will always be a need for repair contractors. And I think the Insurers always recognise that. I think over the past couple of months, we've seen the value, whether it be for you know, 24-7 emergency intervention. Some people have been really good at that. Contracts have stepped up to the plate. Um, or whether it be those kind of special circumstances that have more customers. So I, I think the, the value will be recognised. I don't see any change in terms of uh, insurers' use of contractors and their deployment. I think that we will all need to adapt as we go through this from where we are just now to where we might be in six months' time. I don't have a crystal ball, uh, but you know, I, th I think that there is a huge engagement on both sides of the fence. And I think that the relationships that, uh, that Brian spoke about are very strong between suppliers uh, and their clients. And I think with decent dialogue as we go uh, through this and we see the changing demands of the marketplace, whether it be cost of materials, um, you know, no one's mentioned Brexit, but six months down the line, I suspect there will be price pressure in that respect as well. So we've got several different models of pricing across across networks, whether it be adjusters or direct. Um, and I think that will need to be looked at, but I'm absolutely confident that you know the major players will reflect that as they go forward. Thanks, Andy. Hey, Martin, then, how flexible do you think you're going to have to be in alternative accommodation, not only in the future as we look at the changes that are taking place? You've, you've seen, I mean, both your organise, both you and Kerry's organisation did some amazing work, as did some of uh, your others uh, nine weeks ago, wasn't it, when we had to do this major shift. So how flexible is that led you to believe you're going to have to be in the future? Mm, that's a difficult question to answer, I think, at this stage. Um, I mean, there's always been flexibility, if I'm honest with you. Um, we, I suppose, will be as flexible as we need to be. Um, 
as we said, the, the policyholders' well-being comes first. Um, we always put their needs above every, everything else, um, including cost. But it's hard to say how the next, let's say, four, six, eight weeks are going to pan out for us. I mean, we, I guess, like a lot of companies in the supply chain, a lot of contractors probably are sitting waiting for things to happen, um, probably chomping at the bit at what might be coming down the pipeline to us in the next uh, few weeks, but nothing, nothing may appear. We may still be sitting here in, in four weeks' time thinking, well, not much has changed. So um, I think until we know the full picture and we know what what's going to happen um, over the course of the next couple of months, it's hard to say what's going to be needed of us. But like all companies, we try to be flexible uh, as much as we can and to, to meet our clients' expectations. But, you know, at this stage, it's hard for me to say, Alan. Okay. Kelly, just, I mean, from the impressive work uh, yourselves and Martin's company did eight or nine weeks ago, did it surprise you how quickly the, your industry, part of the industry, was able to shift people from one place to another? Did it surprise us? I don't know. I think it, the first day or so, it was a whole mix of emotion, wasn't it, really? Because you were probably, we, we were all dealing with our own personal stuff, as well as trying to run companies, think about policyholders, plus homeschooling our children, and are we going to see our parents? And, you know, so we're still human beings trying to deal with, we were trying to deal with our own versions of the pandemic, as well as all the policyholders. What didn't surprise me which I'm trying, we'll try not to get emotional, was how brilliant our team, my team were, the team were, the staff were, whether they were throwing ideas at us, whether that, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, our claims handlers ringing the suppliers that they knew to try and get this flexibility sorted, um, whether it was not during their normal nine to five thirty. Um, I don't think we were surprised because we've built up the relationship over all these years. Um, but like I said, I think everybody was just operating on a needs must just got to get through it. How can we, how can we do this? Um, when I look back now, it feels, it feels a bit surreal at though that first week also trying to close down an office to get everybody home working and everyone's been very flexible. I had, a, I had a zoom meeting last night with Tim and Joel, my co-directors. We we're talking about another part of the business. And I said to them both, we've got to be more flexible moving forward as we move forward post COVID. It's, I think it's changed how businesses and the supply chain and all of it, how it's all going to run. That, that lots of things will stay the same, but hopefully flexibility and change, positive change will come out of it. Otherwise, really, what's it all been for? <laughs> I, I certainly think you and Martin and, and your colleagues deserve a lot of credit for what happened there. Um, but the next, the next challenge may just be around the corner, of course. Brian, last but, one, I've, just, I've got it right. Some people have talked about cost and claims just now. What we do know is that the underlying pressure on all the insurers is that home insurance is not a big margin product. Um, so innovation and, and patience is required to get that balance between making sure we're treating customers well, but making sure we're also controlling the cost because there isn't really a lot of money in there. So is that message that the customer will still continue to, to drive settlements in the way you mentioned it earlier? Is that going to be the, the real watchword for your suppliers to know? I think so. I mean, <clears throat> I think yes. However, there's a bunch of opportunities we should take. You know, Kelly's talking there about how the team just adapted and done brilliant work. They didn't have any choice; just done it. Didn't think about it. We we had um, we, we we within Aviva, and I'm sure most insurers have been talking about moving to home working, talking about it for many many years, and we done it within a couple of weeks when we <laughs> when we needed to, and we didn't drop a motor claim or a home claim or a travel claim. Um, and that's pretty fantastic. So the, the one thing we are determined to do is not lose what we've learned. So we have worked in a different way. We haven't, we haven't let down any customers. We have supported our, 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 our networks and they've supported us. So how do we continue to, to, to serve that customer but using your digital means, analytics and all that kind of good stuff to try and make it better and come out of it stronger? And, and that for me is where we should all be. How do we give the customer exactly what they want in a better way? That, that, that it's, it's, if, we, if we build what we had back again and, and, and we don't learn anything from that, that would be a shame. So I, don't, I, don't, I think 
we should all be determined to learn. Great. Brian, that, that's that great. Thank you. That's a great point in which to finish it. I mean, I, I think what we're saying is we've learned how much people can do when they actually pull together and are faced with the circumstances that we're faced with. Just then. I think the industry's got a lot to be very proud of uh, and how it's dealing with that. Um, and it seems to have brought a lot of people closer together. That's great. Brian, Sandy, Martin, Kelly, thank you very, very much for that insight today. I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, this is being recorded if anybody hasn't seen it, so it will be available through the IELTS website onto its YouTube channel or, or something technical like that. But I've, I've been able to get it. I'm sure you will as well. And possibly onto a podcast, which we're moving to. Next week, we're going to go back to the basis again of building claims and how we make sure that, that we're all ready and moving forward and ready to react to much of the uncertainty that we've heard today. Um, so we'll be taking a look at it from both an insurer's perspective, uh, from a network's perspective. We've got some legal views on it and contractors' um, perspective. And, and one of the things that we've done with that, we've had a lot of good frank discussions, but these good frank discussions are the things that help us move forward to the, so, be able to do the sort of things Brian's outlined today. So let me know what you think, Alan at ILCclaims.com. Um, thanks for your support again. If you want registered for the ILC News, for a, any of our a, other webinars, us on, we have a motor one on every Wednesday. Um, uh, if you want onto all our email lists, please give me a shout at alan at iloveclaims.com or look up the website. Um, we appreciate all the support. Uh, this is your industry. Uh, it's really up to you what happens and how it improves. All people like ILC will continue to do is hopefully facilitate the, the good people in this industry begin to really pull together even more and move it forward. And as Brian said, let, you know, come out of this having learned a whole lot of lessons which will help us uh, when we return to business as usual, if there ever is going to be a business. <laughs> That's a subject we don't know. So thank you very much. As I've said every week, please follow all the best guidelines. Make sure that you, your family, your colleagues all stay safe. And I look forward to speaking with you all. Thanks again. again to thank you. Have a good day. Uh, See you. Thanks all.